So while Carlo is is a friend since when we are in Geneva, um, is he, Carlo is an associate professor in machine learning at University College London. And before joining UCL, he was a PhD student at Italian Institute of Technology, a postdoctoral fellow with Poggio Lab at MIT, and lecturer in machine learning at Imperial College. And Carlo research in interest focus on understanding the role of structure in machine learning from the perspective of statistical learning theory with application to structural prediction, multitask learning, and meta learning. And today he is going to talk about meta learning through the lenses of statistical learning theory. Thank you, Carlo, for being here and looking forward to your talk. Great. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for inviting me. And uh, um, I'm uh, really, really happy to, uh, to give this, uh, this introductory presentation in some sense uh, on, uh, on meta learning, uh, which I find uh, to be very, um, a very interesting uh, topic in machine learning for its uh, implication both on practical and theoretical aspect of uh, the design of, uh, uh, of machine learning algorithms. So um, I've designed this, uh, this presentation to be a sort of uh, high level overview of uh, the main ideas and motivations behind uh, meta learning and then try to uh, give also an intuition of what happens theoretically speaking when, uh, when looking at these problems. So that then uh, if, uh, some, I mean, if I'm able to spark any kind of interest in, in the topic, then um, you, you can decide to delve deeper uh, on in, into, into the details of, uh, of the um, of the subject uh, on your own, and even looking at the references that I might give you in, uh, in, this, uh, in this presentation. So just to give uh, a, a one uh, um, sentence introduction, meta learning consists in, uh, it aims to uh, tackle um, model selection by automating the process of uh, selecting the um, parameters of, uh, of a learning algorithm in, um, in an automated way. Uh, the uh, the motivations behind it uh, with, um, are, are start from the the usual uh, perspective from the usual uh, things that we are seeing in the news and uh, from what uh, is actually bringing lots of us to machine learning which is the observation that machine learning these days works wonders it's, uh, we, we have systems that are able to uh, accomplish uh, um, amazing tasks uh, like uh, recognizing uh, um, complex uh, objects in, uh, in visual data uh, or uh, playing games uh, at the human level or even better. Um, even in the automobile industry, we are starting to see uh, companies starting to thinking seriously about self-driving cars using, of course, machine learning to do that. So there are a lot of things that uh, machine learning uh, uh, is, is able to do or will be able to do in the future. But what we often overlook uh, when looking at the news, at least, and not as, uh, of course, researchers, is the fact that uh, uh, all these improvements that we've got over time, they have come with uh, an increased complexity in, uh, uh, in the models that we have been trained. So this is just an example of uh, what has happened, uh, for instance, in computer vision for solving uh, challenges like the ImageNet challenge, where uh, we, we got more and more complex models to, in, in order to be able to deal with, uh, with such large scale uh, complex uh, visual challenges. And, and so over time, we, uh, we needed the, 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 the need that arose for, for us to have more complex model. And so in order to get better performance, the bottom line is that we need all this complexity. And, and the problem with this is that uh, uh, the added complexity poses several problems uh, when training a model in practice. So we need to care uh, of a lot of the knobs and parameters essentially that we need to turn uh, for, uh, for our learning algorithms. Uh, in order to, for them to behave well and to lead to uh, such amazing performances. And this is actually uh, a, often a barrier, a barrier for uh, new users that are coming to machine learning, of course, because they need to learn uh, that uh, model selection is a very important part uh, of uh, training a model, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's a fairly delicate process. Uh, it's uh, difficult to understand what parts are more important, what, what parameters are more important, what, how to uh, choose them. And, and also from the perspective of uh, expert machine learning is uh, in general, uh, extremely time consuming. Um, so um, the solution to this, well, uh, it, it, um, it is tackled by, the, one of the main idea in, in tackling this is by trying to automate it. And uh, the field of AutoML, 
this is the, just the web page of one of the groups that have uh, been pioneering work in uh, AutoML. Um, uh, it is, uh, it's exactly to try to say, okay, let's remove most of the burden uh, from the shoulders of uh, users of machine learning and let's try to automate model selection. There are three main uh, uh, strategies, three main branches to, uh, to this, uh, um, to this uh, problem. Uh, one is uh, hyperparameter optimization um, or, uh, or otherwise neural architecture searches which we're not going to really uh, touch upon in this talk. So they're very interesting, but probably they would require each one its own individual uh, discussion. But what we're going to focus mostly is going to be meta learning, which I personally find uh, very interesting uh, because it tries to tackle the problem of automated model selection in, uh, in a um, very unique way, uh, which is to try to uh, imitate uh, what a human data scientist do or a human a machine learning researcher uh, does. So um, as, um, as you're probably <laughs> uh, same experience as me when dealing with machine learning problems, you, you, what you, what you, the way you have learned how to do model selection has been done by training yourself on top of them. So you have faced the machine learning problem, then another machine learning problems and so on, and you've learned how to do model selection. So meta learning, of course, uh, in a very simplified way with respect to this, uh, uh, to what I described here and what we are able to do as humans, uh, aims to learn uh, from past experiences. So previous machine learning tasks that uh, we are going to give to them uh, to choose what kind of learning algorithm or what kind of parameters are best suited to deal with the task at hand. Okay, so learns uh, from experience, from direct experience to choose the meta parameters. So this was just a very, um, very high, high level uh, introduction on the motivations of, uh, um, of uh, what is the idea behind uh, meta learning. And uh, now we're going to delve a bit into the core of, the, uh, of what I wanted to tell you, um, trying to understand more formally what meta learning is, uh, look at a bit what are the main ideas, what is the latest research on the topic. And what I'm trying to do is to um, describe everything within a single unifying, as much as possible, as much as it can be done, um, general framework, general mathematical framework to do that. So this is going to be probably uh, a very biased uh, perspective. Um, so if you are already familiar with meta learning, you might not necessarily uh, see um, what you're familiar with reflected. So it's good um, also as a starting point for a discussion, maybe offline or online, depending on what we, if we want to start a debate on it. But um, but I think it's uh, it's an interesting perspective uh, uh, to start from at least uh, to, to look at the, um, to, in order to look at meta learning. So uh, with this said, let's first start not from meta learning, but from something that we are all familiar with, just to be on the same page. So with supervised learning and then lift the supervised learning setting to meta learning. So uh, I'm assuming that all of you are going to be familiar with by now, <laughs> if you were not in the before the start of this, uh, of this winter school. Um, uh, in supervised learning, we do have uh, um, these key ingredients, an input and output set, an unknown probability distribution that describes some relation that we want to learn between the input and outputs. And our goal is to learn a prediction function that uh, associates inputs to outputs that tries to, uh, be, um, to be making as, less, as little errors as possible with respect to uh, a prescribed loss function that has been given to us. So in the end, uh, what we do get is uh, a, the goal uh, of supervised learning is to minimize the expected risk, which is simply the expected error that we are going to incur when we are choosing a specific uh, input output predictor. Okay, so we want to find the best one. Uh, of course, as uh, you are well aware, in practice, we never have access to raw. It would be nice to, but uh, um, everything would be much easier, but we do not have access to raw. What we rather have is access to a finite number of, uh, of training points. So a training set of samples coming from raw. Uh, Throughout this talk, uh, assume always this to be coming uh, in an uh, independent fashion, sampled from raw, but of course you can consider a uh, more, more general setting when, where this is not the case. And so what we are looking for in, uh, in machine learning in supervised learning settings is a learning algorithm, which is essentially a function that uh, in a nutshell, uh, given the training set that we have, gives us in output uh, a function. 
a model that we are then, then going to plug into our uh, into our um, expected risk, right? Uh, so uh, just to get an idea of the, 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 the classic example of what uh, of such learning algorithm could look like, well, it would be something like this. So um, something that whenever it sees a training set, tries to find a function within some uh, some space of candidate functions that we uh, might uh, might think are a good idea to solve the problem of the what is called the empirical risk, which is simply the average of all the errors that uh, that function that candidate function is doing on the training set. Um, so the, the main point is that once we do have a learning algorithm, uh, whatever that may be, uh, what we might want to do is try to understand from a theoretical perspective or what kind of generalization, what, what kind of guarantees we can get about its properties on uh, its, um, its performance on future data. So on future data, uh, what we're going to see is uh, uh, compare the expected risk of our learning algorithm when trained on the training set that we had, but compared against new points, so points coming from uh, this distribution row, uh, against uh, the best possible um, solution that we might have to the expected risk, the solution that we might possibly compute if we had access to, to row. Okay, so this thing, this, this difference is called, this gap is called the excess risk. And if we are lucky enough, so if the distribution has some nice regularity property, you're being very sloppy saying that the distribution is nice enough, um, uh, we, we might be able to, uh, to show, to prove that as the number of training points increases, this difference goes goes to zero. So asymptotically, we are actually indeed solving the problem. So if we had an infinite set of points, we would be uh, recovering the ideal solution. And then our algorithm is said to be consistent and it's a good algorithm in some sense. But if we're uh, even uh, more uh, lucky, let's say, we are even able to get what are called bounds or rates for this, uh, for this gap. So something that tells also how fast our algorithm behaves. So in this case, for instance, this is just a prototypical result that uh, says that the error is going to uh, decrease uh, as the number of points increases with a rate, with a speed that depends on some parameter alpha. And what you typically observe by, by doing uh, this kind of uh, uh, analysis uh, is that uh, um, the, the parameter alpha will depend a lot on both the distribution, which again, we do not really have control over, and the algorithm that we have chosen. So since we don't have really a way to control this distribution, what we can do on the other hand is try to uh, look at better choices for our algorithm. So how do we find the best possible algorithm or a good algorithm to deal with a problem so that we get faster rates and therefore we get an algorithm that is learning with many, many less points that we, uh, uh, that we actually need. So one way is to uh, introduce a parametrization, a hyperparametrization, or in this talk is going to be metaparametrization, as we will see, um, of the algorithm. So we choose something that uh, might be anything uh, in this general uh, um, abstract uh, um, introduction that I'm making now um, that describes how the algorithm can be changed, how can we consider different forms of the algorithms. Of course, in principle, we would like to see to, to, to consider all possible learning algorithms. This is not uh, uh, possible uh, in practice because they, they can be many and different uh, crazy algorithms that would be simply silly. Uh, on the other hand, we uh, we know already uh, what we do in, uh, in practical settings. We, we choose some some family of parameters that we can con think of controlling, and we uh, and we can use uh, we, we can use a metaparameterization for them or hyperparameterization for them uh, to to find the best algorithm on our problem. So metaparameter can be the number of iteration that we do when we do, um, let's say, stochastic gradient descent or early stopping, um, the kind of kernel or the kernel parameters if you're using a kernel method, and so on. So there are many uh, different ways. Just to just to give you an intuition uh, of standard uh, ways of, uh, of metaparameterizing your, your problems, um, in the case of Tikhonov regularization, you are solving, for instance, uh, an empirical risk uh, minimization problem by adding a so-called regularization terms term, and in this case, your meta parameter would be just the scalar that tells you how how much you're penalizing solutions to to, to fit to match your data, for instance. In uh, nearest neighbor settings, 
uh, when the perspective is that the algorithm itself uh, is uh, um, is um, using the training data as uh, as a way to uh, compute a, an average of labels around the, your target point. So this is the algorithm trained on D with parameter theta. It's simply considering in order to predict uh, the value of uh, a new target point x bar, just uh, the average of all the labels. So we have uh, the average of all the labels, but weighted according to this similarity. So how this target point is similar to these points. And the similarity could be, again, something like a kernel that is parameterized by theta that says uh, that uh, uh, this point is closer to these points, but farther away from these ones, and so on. Uh, more generally, as I mentioned, uh, you can uh, uh, consider uh, the meta parameter to, uh, to parameterize the number of steps that you do by doing early stopping. So in the case where your algorithm is, uh, um, uh, is returning the um, Thief iterate of uh, gradient descent uh, applied to your empirical risk. So this would be just the steps, and you would just return uh, ft, the, the t step. Well, theta might be exactly defining the steps, the number of steps that you're making, and uh, analogously for, for stochastic settings. Or in stochastic set, or, or in general, you could consider theta to be, for instance, the step size. So the value that you're making, so how large the steps that you're making. So Given all these possible ways of parameterizing uh, um, your algorithms, what we typically do in, uh, uh, um, in single task supervised learning problems is that we do have our, our training data. We typically split it in two parts, a training set and a validation set. And we find the best parameter across a certain range of parameters that we might uh, think uh, uh, being interesting. Um, by training the algorithm with that parameter over the training set and then testing it over the validation set according to our laws. And then we find the best parameter. Okay, so um, this idea of course works uh, uh, pretty well, but requires quite a bit of work on our side on choosing the, the, side, the, the space theta. And of course, I mean, if you choose it to be too large then you risk of overfitting in any case your validation set. So it creates, I mean, it, it, raises, to, it raises quite a few problems. Um, in any case, in uh, meta-learning, uh, what happens is that instead of having one single problem, we said that we are thinking of uh, using, making use of many different machine learning problems. So you can imagine that even instead of having one single, um, one single uh, um, uh, data set or training and validation set, you might have now many training and validation sets. Uh, together, coming from different uh, distributions, right? And our goal now is to find a learning algorithm, to learn what learning algorithms by finding the parameters theta that works well on this family of problems. So a bit more formally, if we have, uh, uh, if we describe this process of sampling tasks from a meta distribution, from a probability distribution over the tasks, over the distributions of the tasks and rows, we can define a new form of risk, which is the risk of our meta parameter by simply, by, by, by looking at the expectation of sampling raw from the distribution mu, and then sampling the training and validation sets from raw, and then doing the same thing that we were doing for cross validation. So lifting essentially cross validation to the meta level, to the level of the tasks, okay? And, uh, and, and now what we can do is that we can look at this problem. We can, first of all, ask ourselves how to tackle this problem when it makes sense for what kind of parameterization of, uh, of algorithms it makes sense to tackle this problem. And then maybe ask some question about the uh, theoretical aspects of, uh, of algorithms that are tackling this problem, whether they are better than just doing cross-validation, for instance. So this brings us to proper meta-learning now. Um, what we, uh, what we uh, what we want to do is to look at this problem, try to find actually a connection with what we know in order to be able to find a strategy to address it in order to get a, a general algorithm to uh, tackle meta-learning problems. So looking back at the risk, oops, looking back at the risk that we just defined, we actually find many similarities with what is a standard supervised learning problem that we had before. So uh, we are sampling some a pair of values, a detrain, a deval. These are typically called query and support sets, but you can imagine them to be the input and output uh, values of your generalized supervised problem, let's say. Um, and then interpret the risk itself, the empirical risk to be the loss function between 
the output of our model and uh, the uh, validation set, so our output. So in, in, we, we immediately see a connection between what we wanted to do in a standard supervised learning setting with what we're doing here. So here, the input would really correspond, X would, really, would actually correspond to the training set, Y would correspond to the validation set. Uh, and the algorithm itself would simply be a, a parameterized model, some parameterized function F theta uh, that takes an in input X and returns something in output. The only real difference is that typically in supervised learning settings, we would have the function going from X to Y's, while here really we have function that goes from input the data sets to models. But we can still look at this analogy and ask ourselves, can we address it with methods that we are familiar with? For instance, can we use uh, stochastic gradient descent to minimize this problem, to address this problem? And the answer is, well, we can if we are able to uh, compute gradients of the, like have uh, actually gradients of these objects so that then we can indeed do gradient steps and optimize theta, right? So this is possible. Um, uh, it simply requires to look at the chain rule application of the uh, computation of the gradient of uh, uh, the object that we are trying to minimize. So gradient of theta with respect to this, uh, this quantity. And, uh, um, and applying the chain rule, we have uh, essentially two big components. This first one is actually that something that we are familiar with already, because it's simply the gradient with respect to the model that we are trying to optimize. Um, so if the loss here used in the risk is uh, differentiable, for instance, or is nice enough, we can easily compute this gradient. The only difference is that we need to evaluate this gradient in the um, trained algorithm with respect to the parameter theta that we are using. But apart from that, once we have it, we can easily calculate it. What is actually posing some issues, some questions at least, is computing the gradient of the algorithm. So we have this algorithm, which again, might be the empirical risk minimizer. And then we are saying, oh, let's see what is the derivative of this algorithm with respect to theta, which is not uh, necessarily uh, so, so clear whether it's even possible to, to be done. Uh, but assuming to, to have this, we can simply apply stochastic gradient descent to address this problem. Um, and, uh, and essentially, this boils down to sample uh, a new task from a distribution at every iteration, sampling a training and validation pair from the distribution from the task that we have sampled, um, evaluating the uh, training the algorithm on the training set that we just uh, sampled, evaluating the gradient in the point of the loss, evaluating the gradient of the algorithm. Again, this is. The, the question that we're going to address uh, uh, in a minute. Uh, and then simply do a step uh, in the direction by combining these two gradients in, in the meta gradient that we wanted. And then simply rinse, repeat, uh, and, uh, uh, and at the end of, uh, of our uh, training process, uh, we will have a learned, a trained algorithm with meta parameters theta n, which is hopefully a very good solution to our learning problem. So that whenever we are seeing a new uh, task, we're going to be able to uh, deal with that uh, um, nicely by, um, by training this algorithm on top of it. So the question remains on how to, um, when it's possible to compute these gradients and how, how do they look like, right? So um, in practice, uh, actually different meta-learning strategies differ by the way they are parameterizing the algorithm uh, that we're talking about. Uh, and, uh, and, and therefore, by, um, by applying the strategy that uh, I was showing you before by doing uh, stochastic gradient descent, but with different choices of the algorithm. So there are three main uh, strategies to that. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, black box uh, approaches, which are fairly flexible, um, allow to cover many different uh, family of, uh, of algorithms here, uh, of uh, learning algorithms. Uh, Metric-based approaches, which uh, are a bit less flexible, but uh, lead to more interpretable uh, intuition of what is going on. And finally, optimization-based approaches, which uh, try to strike a good balance between, uh, between uh, these two methods and indeed are going to be the ones that we're going to probably focus more um, in the rest of uh, what I'm going to tell here. So uh, let's start from uh, black box models. Black box models start from the observation that uh, as I said in the beginning of, uh, uh, of, of the problem setting of uh, meta-learning, uh, 
algorithm, learning algorithm is simply a function that goes from data sets to models, to trained models, okay? So by simply saying this, black box models says, okay, let's try to learn exactly that. Let's try to model in a very um, um, direct way uh, the process that goes from data sets to uh, trained models. So something like this, okay? So this would be your uh, black box meta learner. Of course, this is an extremely flexible uh, perspective because it allows to even learn a new algorithm as, they, as the, the model sees fit. At the same time, you can imagine that is, uh, it can be very complicated to, to actually either train or even model something that makes sense in this setting. So this is a, a very active uh, ongoing uh, research on the topic, but still presents a lot of, uh, of issues together with the, uh, the advantage of, uh, of, the, of, uh, of the added flexibility. Uh, so on the other end of the spectrum, instead, as I mentioned, we have uh, metric-based approaches. Metric-based approaches um, focus on a very specific class of possible uh, learning inner learning algorithms, um, which is essentially uh, learning algorithms that are, um, that are designed to, be, uh, up to, to try to approximate a sort of conditional probability uh, over the uh, output labels, given the target point that we are interested in to predicting and the training set. Um, so, um, uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the assumption of having um, uh, or, or of adopting a nearest neighbor perspective, like in this one, has the advantage that again, like you, you have an interpretable model and you can meta parameterize the similarity function between uh, your uh, target point and your training points so that uh, um, you, you, can, uh, you can focus, you can restrict most of the complexities related to meta-learning only on, on this part. And all the questions related to differentiability or to um, evaluating the algorithm itself are going to be simplified uh, significantly. So in particular, the output of the algorithm, again, is going to be easily uh, obtained since uh, it doesn't really entail a minimization problem here, and simply giving an output uh, this, uh, this average. Um, at the same time, differentiability is going to be guaranteed the moment we design a, an attention kernel that is uh, differentiable. So we are simply learning what kind of metric C is useful in this, uh, in this kind of problems, essentially. So to give a more uh, concrete example of, uh, of a practical learning algorithm that actually works really well in this setting is uh, we can look at matching networks where the similarity uh, kernel, the, the attention kernel, is, uh, um, is trying to compute essentially a probability distribution over training points. So this x is going to be a training point, and we are looking at the similarity between a candidate point and a given training point by looking at this, uh, um, uh, this renormalization essentially of the similarity between um, our target and our uh, training point uh, according to some feature representation. So um, what, what, the, what matching networks are doing is essentially saying, okay, I start from some, uh, uh, some, some input space, some, some domain space that might not necessarily reflect uh, in Euclidean distance, for instance, the, the similarity between my uh, training data. And what I try to do is learn a good uh, feature representation for my points so that then when I'm comparing my the similarity between uh, uh, between my uh, my points, then that is going to be a useful similarity function to be used for the nearest neighbor algorithm when I'm trying when I'm applying my learning algorithm on it. Um, so again, as you can imagine, if we choose uh, these this, uh, encoder networks to be uh, differentiable or to to easily have access to uh, to be such that we can easily have access to subgradients, then you can imagine that. Uh, uh, this, uh, the differentiating and then computing the gradient of the algorithm in order then to get the meta gradient uh, stochastic descent, um, it would be fairly easy to do. So finally, in, on our overview of, uh, of the different uh, approaches to, to meta learning, we have optimization based methods. So optimization based methods uh, consider a wider class of uh, algorithms for, for learning, different parameter, uh, wider parameterization. And essentially, they try to formulate the problem um, of, uh, of obtaining uh, the model out of uh, training data with respect to an algorithm. 
in by, by formulating the, the, the learning problem as a minimization of some uh, fitting function, not necessarily the training set as in this case, you can have different variants as we will see, but essentially um, they, they interpret uh, uh, at least in principle, and we will see that uh, we can approximate this process, uh, the algorithm solving a minimization problem. So in this case, for instance, we are solving empirical risk minimization over a hypothesis space that is parameterized by our metaparameter. And we can change the metaparameter and therefore change the output of the algorithm, but we're minimizing the empirical risk. So you could imagine this space, for instance, to be the, um, associated to the function that you can learn if you are using uh, a, a Gaussian kernel, for instance, a uh, function that you can learn by using kernels with different uh, uh, bandwidth parameters. So you have different solution and you will get different solution out of it and you might want to choose the best uh, uh, parameter out of that. Of course, you can consider even more general models than this one, this is just uh, as an example. The point is that these examples already shows uh, a few uh, key issues with optimization based approaches, uh, which are the fact that uh, we might not necessarily be able to differentiate with respect to theta this minimization problem, because of course, it depends in a very implicit way uh, with respect to the uh, meta parameter, the actual output. And in practice, we may not even be able to find the exact uh, minimizer. And this again might be a problem the moment we are doing the meta stochastic gradient descent uh, approach that uh, um, I showed you I showed you before, uh, simply because we know that we needed the actual solution of the algorithm to be plugged into the problem in order to uh, in order to compute the meta gradient, the final meta gradient itself. Uh, but in order to see how to tackle this problem, let's first look uh, at an example where things actually work nicely. So these issues are no more, um, which is the setting of, uh, of uh, where we are able to compute a closed form solution, the algorithm in closed form solution. So in the case where we are using a, a least squares loss and we are using a learning algorithm that uh, is trying to solve a problem of this form, so where the learning algorithm itself is simply trying to, uh, to, to, um, uh, to train the final layer of a network whose, uh, whose lower layer parameters are parameterized by some feature map that of course we assume to be differentiable. And our goal, our meta parameter is exactly parameterizing the, uh, is exactly describing all the weights of this, uh, uh, of this feature representation uh, network that we are using before that. So in this case, um, it's easy to show um, that uh, the, the solution of, uh, of this problem can be obtained in closed form. And actually, thanks to a bit of regularization here, you can actually uh, get something that is even differentiable, of course, if your feature maps are differentiable. So in this case, closed form and differentiable, you can directly uh, apply, um, apply the meta gradient descent that I described before. Uh, to tackle the other problems, we might want to look at the literature on bi-level optimization instead. Uh, so what we're actually trying to do is something, abstracting what we're trying to do is uh, when we are solving a meta learning problem is something like this. So we are trying to minimize our outer objective, which is going to be the meta risk with respect to the output of the learning algorithm F theta, right? But in the meanwhile, F theta is actually constrained to be the, the minimizer of some problem that depends on theta. So again, like the, the main issue is that we are not able to, uh, we might not be able to compute F theta concretely, but also the fact that we might not be able to compute gradients with respect to theta and therefore we might not be able to solve this problem. So alternatively, what bi-level optimization uh, suggests us is to replace uh, the solution of the minimization problem with an iterative sequence that hopefully is uh, converging towards to it. So we approximate uh, the minimizer with a sequence. And the nice thing of doing that, so for instance, this is simply gradient descent on the, uh, on the inner problem that we had. By doing this, we get something that uh, is now, uh, of course, obtainable. It's uh, exactly the t-t the, the, the t -t rate of uh, the gradient descent, but at the same time is also differentiable. We can simply differentiate through the iterates in a recursive way and we can get gradients of uh, f theta in the end with respect to theta. Um, so a method that is actually following this kind of idea is one of the arguably most famous, uh, uh, most well-known algorithms uh, uh, for meta-learning, 
which is a MAML, model agnostic meta learning, uh, which uh, simply takes the perspective that I was showing you before um, by doing one step of, uh, um, of gradient descent or, or stochastic gradient descent whenever uh, for starting from a certain meta parameter according to the training set that is being seen. So if uh, the algorithm parameterized by theta receives uh, a training set, is returning in output a neural network with, param with weights theta prime, where the weights theta prime are simply being obtained by doing one step of uh, stochastic gradient descent or gradient descent on uh, the, the risk of the, of the model uh, starting from, uh, from F theta. So we are essentially with this, uh, with this approach learning to do fine tuning. In fine tuning, we start from a model that has been hopefully trained on and has some nice starting weights theta here. And then whenever we see a new learning tasks that might be related to this, we can adapt those weights according to, um, uh, to, to, the, to what the, the we get from the gradients of, uh, of empirical uh, loss on the training set in order to reach that point uh, theta prime. Um, so essentially what we are trying to do here is learning to do uh, fine tuning, learning to, to find the best starting point for fine tuning. Okay. Uh, and of course, this is now nicely differentiable as, uh, as we mentioned before, when we took the bi-level optimization perspective uh, and, uh, um, and therefore allows us to adopt the, the meta-stochastic gradient descent approach that we, uh, we saw in um, the beginning. So, um, so just to uh, recap, what we've seen is a, a, a series of, uh, of different strategies to uh, meta learning. So we have seen black box approaches that are quite flexible, but at the same time, not really necessarily efficient and interpretable. On the other hand, we've seen that metric based approaches offer quite a bit of interpretability and some efficiency also, but uh, uh, at the expenses of flexibility. And finally, optimization based approaches approaches which are more uh, well-rounded and then try to find this balance between the two. And indeed, we're going to focus on this family to try to understand a bit from a theoretical perspective what is going on. Um, we're going to consider a, a very, uh, very natural question, but in a simplified setting, just to understand what is going on. So the, the question that we're trying to understand is, now that we have lifted the problem to uh, from cross-validation to cross-validation in some sense, but across multiple tasks, is whether there are settings where it's clear, where we, it's clearly possible to, uh, to show that meta learning is, uh, uh, quantitatively speaking, better than uh, simply doing uh, single task learning, right? So, to do so, I'm going to consider something that is um, similar in spirit to MAML, so to this idea of uh, doing fine tuning, but in a, um, in a linear setting where everything is actually. Uh, simplified uh, by the fact that uh, um, yeah, I'm trying to learn a linear model over my data and uh, um, uh, the risk itself uh, I might possibly assume to be, to, to be um, computed with a convex loss so that everything, all this problem is actually convex in, um, uh, in both W and theta. Um, as I mentioned, this approach is kind of related to MAML because we are here saying that we're doing Tikhonov regularization by encouraging our target vector solutions to be close to this bias vector. So MAML was starting from a point and then moving away from that by only a few steps, one or multiple. While here we are simply saying, okay, stay close to this one. Like you, you pay a lot by straying away from uh, this bias. Um, and if we consider this, uh, this setting, we are able to uh, study the uh, comparison between the um, uh, expected risk of such a model against the um, expected risk of the best possible algorithm that you might actually have uh, in, uh, in, in such a problem, which is an algorithm that essentially returns every time that we're seeing a task, the best possible solution to that uh, task. So here, W raw indicates that the best, uh, the minimizer of the expected risk for that task, so the best possible solution, and could be interpreted as running our learning algorithm uh, on, on infinite training data in some sense. So this is actually the ideal solution. Um, so by doing this, by, by, by uh, looking at what happens in these settings, and in particular, by assuming for simplicity that the training data has the same number of points, just uh, as a detail, 
then we see that for every meta parameter, we are able to find an upper bound on the excess risk, which is of this form. So it, is, it has a rate with respect to the number of points that we are seeing that is one over square root of n and is fixed. So it doesn't really change. So we don't really get better rates in terms of speed of converging algorithms for different meta learning approaches. And this is already an interesting observation that we not really improve the rates. On the other hand, what we do is that we get a significantly different um, potentially constant here appearing on the bound. So we get something that is going to be much, much larger or much smaller depending on the choice of theta. In particular, if we find the upper bound, uh, the, 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 the theta that minimizes this upper bound, what we get is, uh, um, uh, is get uh, theta star, the ideal solution, is the mean of all this, uh, of all, all the tasks that we're seeing, all the solution to the tasks that we're seeing, which kind of reflects our intuition that if we have our task some kind of clusters somewhere in the space, well, we, um, our, our best uh, candidate for, uh, for a bias would be something that is the average of all the tasks. So nothing particularly surprising. But now plugging um, the solution uh, in, inside the bounds and comparing it with the case of independent task learning where actually uh, the uh, meta parameter theta is, uh, is actually fixed to zero, it's simply doing Tikhon of regular standard Tikhon of regularization, we see that the <coughs> two bounds differ by quite significantly by the constant that is appearing in the problem. In particular, we have on one end that the bound is governed by the second order moment and on the other hand by the variance of the tasks. And this might lead in situations where we do have a significant advantage in using meta learning. For instance, when the, class, when the tasks solutions are all clustered in the hypothesis space somewhere far from the origin. Well, we can have situations where we do not really have an advantage when more or less the origin and the mean of all the tasks are kind of close to each other and therefore we do not really have a big difference between variance and expectation of the, uh, well, on the second order moment of our distribution. So just as a take home message here is that we are kind of assuming that when we're tackling problems of this form, uh, the tasks share some kind of structure among themselves. In particular, in this setting, we are assuming the tasks to be clustered, first of all, all together. Then, of course, we want them to be far away from the origin. But the first point is that we want the tasks to be clustered around some, some kind of common archetype. OK. And so the other question is, what if instead we are not really in, uh, in, this, uh, in this setting? OK. Uh, and this brings us to the, the final leg, the most recent advances in, uh, in meta-learning, which is conditional meta-learning, given the amount of time I'm going to uh, briefly skim through, through this. So essentially, the idea is, let's consider a situation where we can easily break uh, uh, the setting that we were considering before. So instead of having one cluster of tasks, we have two clusters of tasks, something like this. In this case, uh, the solution of meta-learning, at least in the simplified setting, is giving us uh, a a starting point, a bias that is really not that good. It has a large variance with respect to what we could have by considering the center of the two clusters separately. So, um, so that really doesn't lead to nice uh, upper bounds with small upper bounds for, uh, for our excess risk. And while this is a simplified setting, you can imagine that the same can happen in more complex situation. So we consider the case of MAML where we were starting from some average and we were doing fine tuning to reach all those points uh, around it. Um, but if MAML is applied to a situation where instead of having one single cluster, we have multiple clusters, we cannot really think of finding one single very good starting point for, um, for clusters, for, 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 uh, for the um, bias of, of our neural network. And therefore, we might have that we can reach easily some points, but then other points need multiple iterations and therefore it defeats the purpose of doing fine tuning. So what would be much better would be something that says, oh, I see this data, this data belongs to this cluster. So let's start from cluster from bias theta one rather than theta two. And instead if data uh, belongs to this cluster, this, this task belongs to this cluster, then use theta two. So consider a more heterogeneous kind of setting and it's an algorithm that is able to deal with this heterogeneous setting by doing fine tuning from there. 
so again, going to uh, going back to uh, the connection between um, meta learning and uh, imitating data scientists, what we would like to be doing in a conditional meta learning setting would be to condition our model, our meta parameters. Well, ideally, even the model, of course, we're going to see something much simpler, depending on the training data that we have. So we see the training data and we condition on top of that. Which was the meta parameter according to that. Um, so formalizing these uh, in within the setting of optimization, for instance, based on meta learning or in general, looks a bit more like this. So we we need to change a bit the optimization problem, the risk that we are trying to minimize, to something like a minimization over a set of functions that, whenever they see a data set, they give us a set of parameters, meta parameters in output. So from D to theta now. And the, the risk itself has not changed that much. We're simply looking at the expectation again over the training and validation sets. We are still evaluating our algorithm on the validation set, but we are training our algorithm on the training set using the meta parameters that are obtained by conditioning them with respect to the output of tau when applied to DTR, okay? The nice thing of this is that if it's too complicated, it recovers the previous setting with the um, tau, of, uh, tau of D, a fixed constant function that gives us always the same meta parameter. Um, it is actually an hybrid model that combines black box approaches because we're going from data set to actual model parameters in some way, but it combines it with the robustness of optimization based approaches because we're still using the whole structure of optimization based approaches. Of course, it adds the complexity of uh, the question of how to parameterize and learn um, and learn tau, uh, this, uh, this, this function, uh, this conditioning function. And here are just a couple of examples of how to do it. Actually, I'm going to give you only one given uh, the limited amount of time that I have. So in Leo, learning output embeddings, uh, you actually model the function tau as the composition of uh, a neural network G applied on top of a feature map uh, over data sets uh, phi. So G is just a neural network that goes from these feature vectors to model parameters and is uh, simply learned uh, in a classic way, while um, phi, the feature map over data sets, uh, is uh, obtained by using uh, a, what is called a data set signature. So something that combines uh, in, uh, in a single average the vectors that are obtained by taking input output pairs uh, in the data set and mapping them into um, into a feature space and then simply considering the average so that we, we account for possible um, permutations of the points in the data set obtaining a simple uh, descriptive uh, representation for the entire data set itself. And of course, G and phi are both learned. So we learn uh, these functions that are producing tau of D, the um, meta parameters that are going to then be fed in a mammal like algorithm, for instance or any kind of uh, meta learning algorithm, uh, actually. Uh, another approach is uh, task adaptive structured meta learning, which uh, I'm not going again to go into the details, but adopts uh, more of a nearest neighbor approach to, uh, to the same uh, uh, problem by considering a task similarity function between data sets and try to consider some kind of average uh, between uh, the possible models that you could obtain um, by training uh, your algorithm on top of, uh, of uh, similar training sets uh, where similarity is obtained according to this uh, uh, attention function. But again, this is uh, probably too much details for um, the amount of time that we do have. Uh, and then um, the, the bottom line of all, of all this discussion is that this intuition of using conditioning and for choosing the, the, the starting point, let's say, of your, uh, of your uh, mammal algorithm to be, um, to be conditioned to the data is actually um, a winning strategy. So in most settings, uh, this is, uh, for instance, rep performance report on, uh, um, on a standard uh, benchmark for, uh, uh, for meta learning, which is uh, MiniImageNet, uh, we can see that uh, conditional methods are generally providing a significant improvement uh, on top of, uh, of unconditional approaches. So they always enrich, um, uh, enrich uh, um, the, the capabilities of meta-learning approaches. Uh, now, 
I don't think we really have uh, time to go over the theoretical aspects of it, but what essentially, mm, briefly speaking, you can do, you can consider a more, uh, mm, like a, an adaptation of the simplified setting that we were considering before for the model biasing by introducing uh, a, a, in the algorithm the possibility of, uh, um, of conditioning the metaparameter according to some side information, for instance, the training data uh, like we were doing in, uh, in the examples before, and then simply plugging them as a, as a good bias point. The nice thing of this setting is, is that it is quite amenable to theoretical analysis because now this function is, uh, is linear, so it's easy to parameterize and to uh, study and to learn. And we obtain results that is similar to, um, to what we were observing before with a different constant now that depends on conditioning. And essentially what we observe is that uh, in, uh, in, the, in ideal scenarios, the ideal solution that we get uh, in minimizing this uh, upper bound is this function T star that is conditioned with respect to this uh, side information like uh, training data and gives you an output uh, uh, potentially the conditional expectation with respect to the side information of your tasks rather than uh, as before the expectation without conditioning with respect to the side information. And this can be quite powerful, this simple, this, this uh, small change, because allows us to solve problems like the one that uh, we started from. So while metal standard and conditional meta learning was giving us a fixed point in between the average of all uh, the training, uh, well, all, all the, the solution of all the, the individual tasks, all the, even in the case of the two clusters, we get something like this. Well, in uh, conditional meta learning, uh, uh, if everything works well, let's say, if the side information, the training data is nicely correlated to the um, to the output to the to the, um, to the tasks, well then we're able to get something like this. Something that every time we see our uh, our task is able to condition and to find a good starting point for that task. Now I know that I went over this very fast, but this was just to give you an intuition of the fact that actually in theory, the the our intuition is actually. Um, um, uh, supported by theoretical uh, theoretical evidence that this is a good idea. And we had something that uh, probably here now, it's uh, too much to go over. So just to, um, so just to conclude and to um, wrap up, um, we have seen that uh, meta learning aims to, uh, to solve the problem of automating model selection by using uh, past experience and past tasks to, uh, to learn how uh, to select the, the best meta parameters of our model. There are many uh, methods to deal with this. We touched upon the main ones, the black box approaches, metric based uh, meta learning, optimization based meta learning. We have uh, pointed out the, uh, the, main, uh, uh, the main pros and cons of, uh, of all these methods. And then we have seen uh, a, um, an example of, uh, uh, of a couple of examples of uh, what is called conditional meta learning that tries to find the base trade off between uh, the, the robustness of what optimization based approaches give us and uh, black box methods, essentially. Um, what we didn't really talk about are many, many things. So, all connections with other uh, approaches to um, uh, to, um, to settings where you have multiple tasks and you want to use the similarity between multiple tasks to make the learning problem easier, such as multitask, continual learning, which you will see uh, later uh, in this uh, morning. We've not talked about uh, something that uh, goes beyond supervised meta learning, let's say meta reinforcement learning, which is instead a very active and important field. And we didn't really touch upon about, I, mean, I even told you what uh, hyperparameter of optimization or neural architecture search is. So there are many things that, uh, that uh, you can um, be interested into and that uh, unfortunately there was not much time to talk about. Um, so just to mention a couple of uh, uh, big open questions, the biggest one in the, in the context of meta learning is how to deal with non-differentiable meta parameters, such as the number of layers of a network, number of nodes, so objects that are discrete in nature, how to learn how to learn them. That's very hard. And in conditional settings, a big question is how to go beyond uh, signature-based models for data sets. I really uh, skimmed through uh, this, but essentially um, uh, all, all, all conditional uh, model proposed in the literature have been focused on 
signature way of representing uh, a data set and this can be limiting in, uh, in a lot of sense and there is active research in trying to understand whether better representation for data sets are possible but just to conclude again there are many uh, questions in meta learning and in general i mean the the door to my virtual office is always open. You can uh, easily reach me. And in particular, I have uh, positions available for PhD working on uh, subjects related to this. So it was just a shameless advertisement at the end. Uh, but that said, um, I would be happy to, to address now any question in these uh, five minutes that remain or, um, or offline uh, at any time. Again. Yeah.